Well, uh, welcome everybody to our EB seminar today. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Tina Del Carpio. I'm a PhD candidate in Kirk Lohmuller's lab. Uh, and I'm here today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Alex Moore. Uh, as part of our seminar series, graduate students can nominate seminar speakers. And I invited Dr. Moore because their research includes learning from uh, and incorporating traditional ecological knowledge and conservation efforts. Uh, that won't be a focus of their talk today, but I definitely recommend if you have a meeting with them later, connect with them after the seminar uh, to ask them about it. Uh, they completed their PhD at Yale with a research focus on predator prey interactions in coastal wetland ecosystems, and that'll be the primary focus of today's talk. Um, after uh, completing their PhD, Dr. Moore worked as a postdoc at the American Natural History Museum, focused on understudied coastal ecosystems, as well as the cultural implications of habitat restoration and conservation. Uh, they're currently a postdoc at Princeton University, where they are working to co-create knowledge and sustainable solutions with local communities in American Samoa. Additionally, Dr. Moore is an NSF postdoctoral fellow. And lastly, later this year, they will be beginning their posts as an assistant professor in botany and forest and conservation sciences at the University of British Columbia. All right, thank you. Give me one quick second to get everything set up. OK, great. Uh, so thank you, Maria, for the introduction. And then thank you all for being here both in person and also those of you in this virtual space. Uh, so as we just mentioned, my name is Alex Moore, and I'm here to talk to you today about my work in coastal wildlife ecology and also the role that predators play within these ecosystems. Oops. OK, so to get started, what I'm showing you here is a map of the global distribution of wetlands, which is terrible contrast here, but just imagine um, where the green represents the wetlands themselves and then the blue represents inland bodies of water. And so as you can see, looking across this map, that wetlands are found on nearly every continent on the planet, but it actually turns out that their definition and their boundaries are really quite broad. So when you say that you work in a wetland, that could mean just about anything. And so what I tend to do in my work is really narrow that focus down quite a bit by saying that I specifically work in coastal wetland systems. Oh, this looks much better. Okay. Um, and so for coastal wetlands, you can really group these into three broad categories. So we have salt marshes, mangrove forests, and seagrass beds. Um, and so these ecosystems are found in both tropical and subtropical regions across the globe, and they make up less than 1% of the Earth's total surface area. So they don't take up all that much space. Um, so despite how small they are, really despite how, how little space they occupy, they actually do perform a lot of really important functions and services, some of which are, are listed here. So they're really important biodiversity hotspots. They provide a number of different climate change mitigation features. They provide a lot of food and water resources for local communities. And then lastly here, they actually have some pretty significant recreation and tourism economies associated with them. So these are incredibly important ecosystems. Now, just because I said that they're important doesn't mean that we have historically done all that great of a job taking care of them, right? And so what I'm showing you here is uh, a handful of some of the more uh, human caused reasons for their threatened status. So coastal wetlands are among the most threatened ecosystems globally. And so four of the main reasons are to are including things like land conversion. So taking something that used to be a coastal wetland and turning it into something else. So aquaculture or urban development. Next is uh, deforestation. So this is specific to mangrove forests, but they have really important timber resources that leads to their, their general decline globally. Um, next is climate change and the associated sea level rise. So as you can imagine, a coastal system is probably going to be directly and significantly impacted by sea level changes. And then lastly here, what I'm trying to depict is uh, the, the removal of certain species from these ecosystems can have these cascading effects that can lead to the loss of function and the loss of health for these coastal systems. And so given that these are really important environments and also given that they are in decline globally, um, there's actually some pretty significant conservation and restoration efforts that happen for these ecosystems. Sorry, I'm also going to moderate the Zoom room. Cool. Uh, and so the goal of restoration for these ecosystems is really to take something that looks a bit like this. So this is an unhealthy, degraded coastal system, and then turn it into something that looks like this, right? So the goal here, at least visually, is to get something that was once um, degraded or denuded and is now sort of healthier and a more functional coastal system, 
Um, but in order to do this well, we do have to have a pretty good understanding of like how these systems work in the first place, right? You can't just like go out and say that you're going to do a thing to improve the system if you don't know what makes the system tick uh, to begin with. So before I actually get into my own specific research, I do want to just walk you through a little bit of the history of what we know about wetland ecology, um, identify some of the gaps that exist in that knowledge, tell you a tiny bit about some more recent research, and then think about how all of these different pieces might fit together to help improve how we do conservation and restoration for these spaces. Okay, so uh, this particular story begins in the mid 1950s, where we had some early studies in coastal salt marshes and mangrove forests within the United States that aimed to evaluate ecosystem productivity and energy flow. And so here, these early researchers were really looking at the different components within the ecosystem. So producers, herbivores, uh, carnivores, and try to get a sense of how energy is moving throughout the system and being utilized. Um, and so the goal of this work then is to really understand of these components, what things are utilizing the most energy? How is it coming into the system? How is it leaving the system? To really try to figure out what are the most important elements. And so the figures here, which I won't go through, but these are two figures from this paper that came out in 1962 that aim to really depict that. So we've got these different ecosystem components and we're trying to track the movement of energy throughout the system to see what actually has uh, the most impacts. And so from this early work, um, a pretty big ecological paradigm describing coastal wetland systems was developed, where the researchers then concluded that the tides are what's most responsible for the large amount of plant biomass production and the production of detritus across these systems. And so further, they then said that structural aspects of the system, so think about things like species diversity or plant distribution patterns, all of those things are really maintained primarily by these abiotic processes or things happening from the bottom up within these ecosystems. And so some of the examples of those those bottom up features include things like the frequency and duration of tidal flooding, salinity, and sediment characteristics. And so the sort of reigning idea here is that these bottom up features are really what matters the most across these ecosystems. And it's this particular narrative about coastal wetland systems that really persisted through the 90s and into the early 2000s. But by the early 21st century, it became increasingly evident that consumers do play a pretty big role within these ecosystems. Um, but it turns out that still most studies tended to emphasize bottom up factors and sort of their evaluation of coastal systems. And so this might be tricky to read, um, but this is a paper that came out in 2016 where these researchers were really trying to look at of all the papers that come out in, on coastal wetland systems, which proportion of those papers are really looking at bottom up factors in these ecosystems, which are looking at top down factors and which ones are looking at sort of a combination of the two. And as you can see, so the bottom up factors are this dark black bar. Um, these studies that focus on that component far outnumber studies that look at any other component uh, in terms of the impacts that they're having within these systems. And so the top down features are noted by the white bar and then the combination studies are noted by the gray bar. And you definitely see an uptick in those over time, but still we're not seeing nearly as many studies that look at these factors uh, as compared to those that are focusing on these bottom up features. So given this, I think it's pretty fair to say that we don't really have a great understanding collectively of how these systems work, right? We have a decent understanding of the bottom up factors that generate certain uh, observed changes or impacts within the system, but we don't know too much about these top down effect, effects that might, might really matter. And so in an attempt to get at that, Within the same study, uh, these researchers then did a meta analysis to say, let's collect a bunch of these papers that look at top down features and see what we can tell um, is going on here. And so what they determined is that consumers drive vegetation dynamics within coastal wetlands. And so we know that consumers are doing something to impact at least this particular feature across these spaces. And so this is a figure that comes from that paper. You can't see it. There's a little zero uh, dash line across the zero mark in both of these figures. And what they're looking at is a variety of different consumer species, all of which are herbivores specifically to be clear, um, and trying to get a sense of how these different species might influence a variety of different plant traits related to reproduction and, and growth and survival. Uh, and overall, which is tricky to see, but just believe me, or read the paper, I guess, 
um, you can see that consumers, or at least herbivores, are having some pretty significant effects on these different vegetation traits, right? So the effect could either be positive, it could be negative. There are some neutral cases, but uh, overall, we are seeing a pretty significant impact of consumers on uh, these particular features across these ecosystems. So as with previous studies uh, looking at coastal wetlands, the real big focus here is how vegetation is being impacted. So what are the ways that consumers are affecting vegetation? Because that might then tell us a bit more about uh, attendant impacts that are also related to vegetation structure and function. Um, but I think we all know that ecosystems are more than just their vegetation, right? So there are lots of other things that could be at play here, thinking about things like soil dynamics and also considering other kinds of consumers, right? So ecosystems are also more than just herbivores. And so we don't have a super clear understanding about how these other effects might also be really important or, or driving different changes across these systems. Okay, and so this is the last bit of intro, I promise. Uh, to sort of try to get a better understanding of those elements of the system. Uh, I did some work with a couple mentees where we went back through, collected as many papers as we could on coastal wetland systems where they're really evaluating consumer impacts and just trying to understand what do we see uh, if we look at this from a more broad angle, a broad perspective to get a better understanding of these systems. And I, I have just three particular takeaways here. So, the first thing that we noted in collecting all of these papers is that the vast majority of studies looking at consumer effects within coastal systems are done in salt marshes. So I mentioned earlier that there are lots of different kinds of coastal systems, but most studies happen in salt marshes, which means that our collective understanding about coastal systems is actually mostly a collective understanding about salt marshes. Uh, so that's one, I think, pretty big bias and a big takeaway that needs to be addressed. The next one is really thinking about uh, the consumers evaluated within these studies. So most studies are looking at one trophic level or at least one type of species. So it's either herbivores or it's uh, detritivores in these cases. Um, but the, we didn't find any studies that looked at species that have maybe mixed trophic placements or, or, or species that are clearly predators and how those species might be impacting different kinds of features across these environments. And then the last takeaway here, is that uh, we also looked at studies to see what other kinds of metrics were they taking across the ecosystems in terms of the impacts that consumers might be having. So beyond vegetation, other things happening across these spaces. And we can see across these studies that we are having studies show that consumers are impacting a variety of different metrics in these systems that are not just vegetation based. Um, but there were a ton of different variables. <laughs> they didn't often have units that could be compared to one another. So we couldn't really combine that information together to say, here's our larger picture, broader understanding of how consumers impact these different soil properties. We just don't have enough robust data to then compare in that way. So there's a lot that we don't actually know in terms of generalizable takeaways in terms of the role that these different species might be having on these processes. So all of this together, brings me to the two questions that I'm hoping to address uh, in, in this talk today. So the first one is the title of my talk. So what is the role that predators play in maintaining ecosystem properties or ecosystem functions across these coastal wetlands? And then the second one is really thinking about what are the relative contributions of both those bottom up and those top down factors? Because we know from historical studies and also more recent ones that these bottom up factors do matter. Um, we also are starting to understand that top down factors also matter. So trying to get a better sense of how collectively these two things might be influencing change, I think is something that's really important and, and interesting to, to look into. Okay, I told myself to take like a water break at a certain points, so I'm gonna do it right now. Okay, so to get at these two questions, uh, I worked in New England salt marshes, and I know I just said that we always work in salt marshes, um, and I, I, will, I will say that the reason I did this was, number one, because I lived in New England at the time, um, but then also because there are so many studies out there on this particular site, it means that I can try to fill in some of those gaps by collecting additional data that we didn't already have for those spaces, so that's my justification there. Um, and so as far as these uh, sites work, I just saw a couple pieces of background. They are really important. So they perform a lot of functions and services that are crucial for local communities. They've experienced some pretty rapid losses more recently due to some of those anthropogenic impacts that I mentioned earlier. And then there's also some pretty significant restoration efforts that are ongoing across these spaces. 
And then in terms of the specific study system that I focus on, I'm just showing you here the four species that were really the focus of, of my work. So looking here at smooth cord grass, so that's the, the dominant vegetation found across New England salt marshes. Uh, next was the fiddler crab. So this is a burrowing crab and a detritivore across these spaces, which you actually find them in like large, large numbers. So they're quite present across the landscape. Uh, we're gonna jump down to the diagonal here and focus on the purple marsh crab. So this is another burrowing crab and it's an herbivore across these spaces. And then the last one here is the European green crab, which is uh, being sort of used as a functional predator within this particular space. But I imagine that anyone familiar with this area might have questions about that, which we can come back to later. Okay, so that's the specific community that I focused on. And then just to give you a quick sense of field sites. So I lived in Connecticut. So the work that I did was focused on coastal Connecticut. And then within this particular box, I had three field sites that were spread across here. So it's a little tricky to see, but there's three within uh, this region. And then these sites were selected for their similar physical features, their shared ecological communities, and then also their shared tidal regime. So the goal here was to find sites that were as similar as possible so that any manipulation that I made within those sites, I could hopefully attribute to those specific manipulations rather than any differences that might exist between those locations. Okay, so as a quick reminder, this first question that I'm focusing on is uh, trying to understand the role that predators play within these coastal systems. And to get at this particular question, I did a manipulation experiment across these three field sites where I set up experimental cages, which looked like this. And then with these cages, they were then assigned to three experimental treatments. And so these are just being shown here. So the first one was really just looking at an open or cage control. So these ones actually didn't have like enclosure cages. So it was either open plots or cage or open cages to get a sense for just baseline conditions happening at the site without me making any particular changes to the site itself. And then I had two uh, manipulation treatments where the first one was the predator exclusion treatment where I had those cages set up and then uh, the purple marsh crab and the fiddler crab could move freely throughout these cages, but the predator was fully excluded from accessing these cages. And then the final treatment here was uh, the predator inclusion where <clears throat> the purple marsh crab and fiddler crab can again move freely throughout, but now the predator is fully confined to those cages. And so the goal here was really to try to get a better sense of those trophic dynamics that might also be influencing the different kinds of effects that are happening across these systems. And then in terms of uh, what was measured, the goal here was really to go through and try to measure as many similar metrics as are commonly used to really evaluate properties and health across these systems, and then try to make sure that we're measuring them in ways that can be consistently compared across other studies. So really to try to find ways to future researchers can then do a meta-analysis and compare these, these data more reasonably than what was possible to do before. And so these metrics include things like burrow density. And so this is important because it's meant to be sort of an approximation of population size. Since those burrowing crabs, you can't just go out and count them because they're underground for the most part. Um, generally speaking, burrow density is used as an approximate way to get to population size. And then I also looked at above ground biomass, soil organic matter content, extractable soil nitrogen, and then uh, the rate of change in soil nitrogen. And the goal here is really to try to get a sense of how nitrogen might be mineralized across these, these systems. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you a really big figure. And so I'm just warning you, it's a really big figure on the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so what I want to do in that next slide is walk you through the data that we collected across those three field sites, but I know that that can be overwhelming. So instead of going into all of the detail of those, what I'm actually going to do is just highlight um, for which variables at which sites that I see significant changes. So we don't have to know exactly what those changes were or what they were differed from relative to other ones, but just note that you saw a change. And so that's the way that I'll evaluate these data just from a very high level perspective. So, oh, contrast is terrible, but it's fine. We'll make do. Uh, so here's the figure. And so a little tricky to read, but across the top are the three field sites that I worked at. Uh, across the bottom, which is super tiny, but these are those three uh, treatments. So our control treatment here, the no predator treatment, and the predator treatment. And then along the y-axis, you'll see those different variables that I measured across those sites. So I'll uncover them as I go. 
Um, and so I'll start with just this very top one. So looking at soil organic matter content across these three sites and across those different experimental treatments. Um, of the three sites, at two of them, I saw some significant changes as a result of some of these experimental treatments. Um, and so that's actually all I'll say here. And then if we look at another variable, so now we're looking at uh, nitrogen content in the soil uh, across all three of these sites, we saw some significant changes associated with treatment with uh, changes again in nitrogen content in the soil. And then the last one I'll, I'll show for now is biomass, so above ground biomass. And so for this variable, at an, again, another two of the three sites, we saw some significant changes associated with um, treatment that then influenced above ground biomass. And so as you can see, just sort of looking at this, nothing makes sense, right? There's changes at certain sites, not at others. There, and when we do see some changes at one site, they're not even the same changes that we see at another site. And so I think that the biggest picture takeaway here is that one predator presence or absence is still being associated with changes, but that those changes are clearly very context dependent, right? So one thing that I saw in one place is not necessarily going to be the same thing that I see somewhere else. And so, uh, I imagine that this leads to certain questions around like what influenced those things. And so we didn't actually go out and directly evaluate these in the study, but just based on observation or time across these sites, we have some uh, guesses, I guess, in terms of what are some of the things that we think might be influencing these changes or these differences. So the first one is just as simple as thinking about initial conditions. Each of these sites started somewhere uh, at one position that is very different than the way the other site started in terms of like organic matter content or in terms of biomass content. And those initial conditions could likely have informed some of those final conditions because we measured these at, at separate time points. Um, another thing that's also important to consider is burrow collapse. So in measuring burrow density as the way that you evaluate prey size, um, because these are coastal systems, the burrows that are present are pretty likely to collapse over time if they're not structurally sound. And so any measurement that we take in burrow density here might not necessarily be as accurate as we want it to be. And burrow collapse is not necessarily predictable. So you might see it at one site, but you maybe wouldn't see it at another. So those are some things that could influence those outcomes. Uh, next is really just, some nuanced differences in the ecological community. So the species that I was focusing on were present across all of the sites, but there were some subtle differences in other species that I saw present at one site that I didn't see present at other sites. And so things like that may have also driven some of the differences that we see across those treatment effects. And then the last one that I want to note here is really thinking about differences in anti-predatory behavior across those sites. So I worked with a couple of different potential prey species, and even across those sites, the behavior of that species might be different in response to the presence of a predator, right? So one example of that here is that for most of these, or for both of the burrowing species, it's possible to see either an increase in burrows, right, in the presence of, of a predator to help get, you know, get away from predators or predator evasion. Um, but you can also see cases where that species might just leave, just like might not spend their time in that place. So you wouldn't actually necessarily see an increase in burrow density if that prey species decides to just relocate from an area where, pre where predators are present. So things like that are possible for, for having influenced some of those changes that we saw across those sites. Um, but nonetheless, I think that there are still a couple really important general takeaways here. First one is that predator presence or absence is certainly associated with some significant changes that we saw in the data. And I think it's important to note here that it's not only in vegetation, but also in soil properties. So again, historically, most studies have focused on vegetation, noting that that's likely where most of the impacts will be seen. Um, but we are seeing increasing evidence that soil impacts are also occurring and those need to be taken into account. And then the last one here is that these impacts are pretty context dependent, right? So changes that we saw at site one are not necessarily the same changes that we saw at the next site. And so noting that context dependency and being aware of that is going to be really important in terms of having any kind of predictive power or ability to uh, impact how we interact with and conserve and try to restore these spaces. All right. So that brings me to the second question, which is thinking about what the relative contributions of bottom-up and top-down factors are across these systems. And this is going to be a pretty important one to address, especially when we start to think about how we attempt to, to do restoration across these spaces. And so for this particular question, I actually didn't go out and do another experiment. That's on my to-do list. Um, but instead, what I did was I took the data from the previous study and just tried to ask a different question with that data. So I tried to analyze that data in a slightly different way. 
And so to really think about the differences or the relative contributions of these different components of the system, I actually did uh, what's known as a path analysis, which you may or may not be familiar with. But the general goal of a path analysis is that it really provides a means for evaluating co-variation among variables. Uh, and so as an example, previously, when I was going through some of our results, I was thinking about how might uh, changes in soil organic matter content or changes in soil nitrogen be associated with predator presence or absence? It's also possible that changes in soil organic matter content influence changes in soil nitrogen, right? So those variables are not entirely independent of one another. And so trying to understand how those interactions or those relationships uh, manifest will be really important to really get a bigger understanding of, of some of the dynamics happening across these systems. And so in using a path analysis, you're then able to include all of your variables in a model and then explicitly define what you think the relationships are between those different variables. And then from there, you can determine the relative contributions of each of those variables to whatever observed changes that you saw. And then the next step that's not written here is that you build a diagram to visually see what those relationships look like. Okay. And then just for those who are interested, so I work in R, and so this is just one example of that model. So I have these different variables, and then I know which other variables within that system do I think may have directly influenced those changes, and then you put them all together, and then you see what happens. So what I want to show you here is the three different sites, uh, and I'll show you the, the path diagrams that I developed and created for each of those sites. Um, they're going to look slightly different. And so with each one that I'll uncover, I'll just walk you through what the figure means and then walk you through what I think the big picture takeaway is for, for that particular site. So for the first one here, uh, we're looking at Farm River. So this is one of the field sites. And so again, you build the model, you put in all of the variables into this path analysis, and then each of these numbers is basically telling you what is the relative contribution of this variable to impacts on, on that variable within your system. And what matters within these ones, I've actually put in bold the uh, variables that have the most significant impact across that system, or, or at least with the data that I had for that site. And so that's noted here. And so for Farm River, what we're saying is we have all of these different variables included in the model. But what's coming out is that burrow density down here is having a significant impact on soil nitrogen content. And that's the only one coming out of this particular model as being significant. And so just in terms of how we want to categorize this, that means at least at this location, we're saying burrow density is a top down effect, right? So we're saying that that is related to prey population size, which might then be related to different uh, functional roles or things that that species is doing within that site. And so we're saying for this model, the top down effects are the ones that are sort of driving the changes that we're seeing. And that's just where we will leave our, our understanding of that particular site for now. So for the next one, so this is Fence Creek. Uh, again, a very similar model. The variables are slightly different for this model, um, but the sort of inclusion of them and the way that they're being analyzed is exactly the same. And so for this one, uh, we've got two different ones that are coming out as significant. The first one is uh, soil organic matter content is significantly influencing nitrogen content. And then the last one here is looking at burrow density and it's significantly in influencing biomass. And so for this site, we're seeing both a bottom up, right? So that's organic matter content, a physical characteristic or property of the system influencing nitrogen. And then we're also seeing top down. So again, the burrow density influencing biomass. We're seeing a combination of the two coming out as being really important for this particular site. And then the last one here is looking at uh, the third site. So this is Hemanasset Beach State Park. Uh, and so for this one, it's even busier. <laughs> where we now have four different variables that are coming out as being significant. So the first one is pre the presence or absence of a predator is influencing nitrogen content, uh, organic matter content, or sorry, burrow density is influencing organic matter content. Burrow density is also influencing nitrogen content here. And then the mineralization of nitrogen is influencing biomass. And so similar to the previous one, we're seeing a combination of both bottom up and then top down playing out at this site. So we're seeing a, co a combination of the two. Uh, and so like the previous uh, data that I showed you, we're seeing a ton of context dependency, right? You look at these different sites and you're seeing different relative roles being played of bottom-up factors versus top-down factors. And so again, like the previous one, there are some potential explanations for that. Um, 
first three are the exact same ones that I talked about before. So these are not different, they wouldn't have changed. Um, so these, these different uh, effects are still likely to have influenced some of those different outcomes that we saw. But one thing that's new for this is uh, to take into consideration some of the local or regional context of these sites. So we have to think about things like land use history. We also have to think about things like the position of the field site in the broader landscape and what other inputs might be influencing that system. These are coming out as being pretty important to consider, especially with regard to thinking about the relationship between bottom up and top down impacts across these spaces. Okay, this is supposed to be another water break. So I'm just gonna do that. Okay, so what I like to think about in all of the work that I do is um, trying to find ways to apply this information. So not necessarily doing research and then creating knowledge simply for the sake of learning a new thing, but also trying to think about how do we apply this to something in the real world. And so for me, what this means is to really think about how can this information apply to improve, improving how we do restoration across these spaces. And so just to give a tiny bit of background, um, as I mentioned before, wetlands are incredibly important ecosystems. A lot of restoration takes place within them. Um, but the way that we traditionally do wetland restoration may not necessarily be all of the things that we need to consider in a restoration effort. Uh, and so restoration is quite diverse in terms of how you approach it, but most efforts include at least these three elements in the way that they do it. And so the first one is really thinking about trying to identify whatever the, the disturbance is or whatever is causing the problem within the system and addressing that, because it doesn't make sense to do anything else if the degrading factor is still present and impacting the system. The next step is usually to think about how do you restore soil quality and then improve the hydrology of the system. So make sure that your soil is in good condition and that your water is flowing freely and properly throughout your ecosystem. And then the last step here is really to think about um, adding vegetation back to the system with the goal here of really focusing on vegetation as habitat. So other things will come back into these ecosystems and then provide attendant functions along with their presence. Uh, and so with this typical traditional approach to restoration, we're really focusing on those physical features still. And we're, we're counting vegetation here as a physical feature because it's really being used here as structure. Um, and this is really born from one, th those original studies that said the physical factors are most important, but also from this really typical ecological concept where, you know, if we build it, they will come. So if we build this site, if we build the habitat, things will come back to it, and then it will just become healthy on its own over time. And that is true in some places, but it is certainly not true in all cases. And so it turns out that the way that we do restoration in wetland systems is typically not as successful as we would like it to be in terms of meeting whatever goal we had for restoring that space. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here is a paper that came out in 2014, so it's data from that paper, where researchers went through and evaluated wetland ecosystem restoration efforts, um, and then tried to evaluate how well do restored wetlands perform compared to a natural healthy wetland system. And then they did so by evaluating a number of different important ecosystem services, which are all listed here. Um, and so again, a little tricky to see, but the zero dashed line is right down the center. And then anything that's above zero, so a positive value indicates that the restored wetland performs better than the natural one. And then negative values indicate that the restored wetland underperforms compared to the natural healthy wetland system. And so what you can see for largely all of the different ecosystem services measured with the exception of cultural values, which is slightly different, um, restored spaces, specifically wetlands, typically underperform compared to the reference wetlands. So, so the, the, the wetlands that they're hoping to emulate uh, as a result of restoration. And so this ends up being a, by about an average of 33%. So biodiversity and uh, different ecosystem properties or processes tend to be reduced in restored wetlands by roughly 33% compared to natural reference wetlands. So there are a lot of reasons for this, um, which include things like the local context, what was the cause of the degradation in the first place, what's the climate, there's a lot of different variables that we do know play a pretty big role. Um, but it also may be that we just are approaching restoration without the right kind of information to be able to do the job well. And so with this focus on uh, 
addressing physical features across these spaces, we might not be including other variables that are also known to be pretty important in terms of impacting different processes across these spaces. And so in this case, what I think this means is really trying to rethink our approaches by not uh, disregarding the importance of physical features, because we know that those are important, but also trying to add in some more of those biotic features that might be really important. So in some cases that could mean rewilding to be able to get better recovery of whatever features or services that we're, we're looking for within these spaces. Uh, and so an example of that looks like this. So let's imagine, this is my attempt at an ecosystem diagram. Um, let's uh, imagine that we have this coastal salt marsh system where predators have been systematically removed from those spaces. So we have a pretty high population size of different kinds of herbivore species or detritivore species that have overconsumed vegetation, things are not growing, it's just overall not having a great time. We can sort of imagine this situation where we restore some of those physical features, but it might also just be really important to make sure that we have the reestablishment of a healthy predator population across those spaces. Um, and so with this work, you can sort of imagine how, if we are able to do that well, we can then reduce prey population size in a way that allows for vegetation to grow back within the system. And then other things function the way that they're supposed to, prey. Right? And then everything is generally happy, healthy, and works well. And there's actually some evidence to suggest that this is possible within these kinds of contexts, right? And so if we look at my work specifically, um, so this is data, these are data that come from uh, that same study that I mentioned to you before, but now we're just zooming in to one variable at one specific field site. Uh, and so again, across the bottom here are those three different treatments where the first one here is this control. And so what I'm highlighting here is really just what are the baseline conditions at this field site looking at nitrogen absorption without me doing anything to it. And so now we're looking at uh, the absence of the predator. So we remove that predator from the system and we see a pretty significant attendant decline in that level of function in the absence of the predator. And now looking at uh, the treatment where the predator is included in those, we see that we are seeing an increase relative to the absence of the predator. So this is really recovering back up to those levels that we saw in the control conditions. And so again, this is really small scale, super hyper specific data, um, but it does indicate the potential for predators to play a, a helpful role in addressing some of the, de the declines that we see within these spaces, or at least the, the lack of full recovery that we're seeing in some of those places. So trying to add these things back in could be really helpful. Now, I understand that an easy question to anticipate here is what about the context dependency, right? Like this might not work in all cases. And so I think that as is true with most ecological research, the answer is basically that more research needs to be done. Uh, and so what I think that can look like depending on um, the focus is that these are important areas of additional study. So recognizing what might be the importance of the local ecological community and how those different species might play a role in the function of those spaces. Uh, next is understanding the regional context and land use history. Another is again, trying to better understand and articulate the relationship between those bottom up and top down features. And then the last one here, which is something that's new for me, is consideration of the soil microbial community. I think that for the large portion of the way that restoration is attempted, we're really just focusing on consumer species, species that we know play ecosystem engineering roles, things of that nature. They tend to all be above ground, but there's a lot happening below ground that's also gonna be really important across these spaces. Okay, so the very last thing that I wanna say here, just like flown through these slides, uh, is to really think about what else might matter across these spaces. Um, and so I know that everything that I've said up until now has been really focused on the science, but as Maria mentioned earlier, a lot of my work is also thinking about how do we incorporate other ways of knowing and other kinds of knowledge systems into the way that we do this work. And so I think it means incorporating different approaches to uh, ecosystem management and different approaches to understanding the way that people interact with their spaces. And so in particular, to me, this means thinking about what role do uh, culture and other social science elements play in the way that we do restoration and conservation of these ecosystems. And so uh, these are four papers that are meant to show you that it has become increasingly clear that local and cultural values play a really important role in the way that we practice conservation and the way that we do restoration across these spaces. 
And so these four papers are just examples that have come out in the last decade that are indicating how important it is that cultural values, the, the important role that cultural values play both for local communities, but also for how people do land management across uh, regional and, and global spaces. And so what I wanna do is just highlight one really specific example from these, which comes from uh, a study that came out in yeah just last year where the researchers are really trying to understand what are the different relationships the relationships that we see between uh conservation outcomes but also thinking about human well-being right so we shouldn't think about these things as being very distinct they do inherently influence one another and then the other level of this is really thinking about who is in control of the work being done so in particular for this study so they're highlighting different kinds of impact as a result of conservation action. And so these can fall into these different categories where outcomes can be positive for local communities in terms of their well-being and also positive for conservation. They could be negative for both well-being and conservation. There are trade-offs, which you can imagine where one might be positive, one might be negative, and then more complex outcomes that don't fall easily into those boxes. And so they're also trying to understand what the role is of who controls the work and how that might influence outcomes. So looking at work that's focused on those controlled by external actors, so think about large NGOs that are coming into a place to do conservation versus those that are locally controlled by people who live in those areas and who have a lot of connection and ties to uh, collaborators and also to the land in those spaces. And so I'm just gonna highlight two of these different outcomes because I think the rest are quite complicated. <clears throat> but the first one is just this top row. So looking again, at conservation efforts that have positive outcomes for both human well-being and also conservation, we see that those that are externally controlled make up a pretty small proportion of, of the data <clears throat> for uh, external conservation. So 15% of these studies uh, or of these efforts uh, were positive for both human well-being and also conservation compared to 56% for those that are controlled by local communities. So recognizing that local communities tend to have a much higher proportion of positive outcomes in their work relative to those that are controlled by external agencies. Whereas for the negative side of things, we can see here that externally controlled conservation tended to be negative outcomes for both well-being and conservation in about 34% of the cases, which again, compared to 3.4% of the cases in locally controlled conservation efforts. And so this gets a bit more complicated as you go through the table, but even so, these two examples, I think, show a really important a clue into how we can do this kind of work better, right? So it can't just be NGOs coming into places and dictating the work that's done. It really should be about building capacity for local communities to do this work well themselves with the goal of not only meeting specific conservation targets, but also meeting well-being targets for the communities that live in those places. So making this reciprocal as opposed to driven in one direction only. And so the way that I'm just gonna wrap this up is by noting that I think it's pretty clear in the work that I've shown here that we have some pretty big gaps in our understanding of coastal wetlands, right? Specific to ecology only. And if we broaden outside of ecology, I'm sure that we will know even more gaps in what we do and don't know about the way these systems work. And these gaps may be informing how well we are able to protect and restore these kinds of systems. Um, but it's also really important to recognize those social and cultural variables that also do really influence outcomes and then impact both conservation, ecosystem health, but also human health. So those things are really tied well together. Uh, and it's my belief that when you combine these two things together, you're able to get better, more sustainable, more inclusive outcomes for the work that we do. And so that's really the goal in all of my work moving forward. So I didn't talk about too much of that here, um, but moving forward into the work that I do now and the work that I intend to do in the future is really about marrying these two things together and not thinking about them as separate things, but noting that they both deserve to have explicit foreground attention in, in the way that we do this work. And that's it. So I've got a slide of references. And so if you want to take these down, you can. Um, but then beyond that, I just want to thank you all for being here and super happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, so should I moderate myself? I don't know what the rules are. Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, so 
European bean crabs, as their name indicates, are non-native, uh, invasive, one might say, uh, to those spaces. And so the reason that I chose to work with them is because, at least in New England, um, blue crabs have seen a pretty sharp decline in their population size. So they have not been present in robust numbers across these spaces. And so they just are hard to come by. So if I had the choice, I would have used blue crabs for that experiment. Um, but I chose green crabs because they were there. And um, there have been studies that do indicate that they do play a pretty impressive replacement role for um, blue crab predators across those spaces. I know that they do a lot of other terrible things, um, but there is actually, so there are a few different examples of how mostly in Massachusetts, where the absence of a blue crab has led to the loss of function and health of coastal systems and the invasion by the green crab into those spaces, you've seen the recovery of that salt marsh as a result of its presence. Um, and so the reason that I chose to do my work with them was when they were there, but then I also does, I do think it indicates uh, a more nuanced way that we should be thinking about non-native species, right? So there are some species that are present in these spaces that have negative impacts, but also have positive impacts. And so I don't think that that should be left out of, out of the conversation. So I wouldn't like suggest that you put a green crab somewhere that it isn't already, but I would say that if it's present in this space and it's doing something that you do find beneficial, then that's worth considering and having additional conversation about. So that is my long-winded answer to that question. Yeah. I don't know if there's stuff in the chat room too that I should be looking at. Okay. Yeah. 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 Super. Very interesting. I was particularly intrigued. Sorry. I have all the coverage. No, no, you're good. I was particularly intrigued by the consumer that the point to the U.S. was only the two. Yes. And I'm wondering if, like, and, and sorry because I, I know some people, but I'm wondering if, like, the world yeah. that is doing the movement of the, the super point or the answer, micro threat. Yeah, so the answer to that is yes. And it's also that it's mixed. So in some cases, we definitely do see uh, like compensatory growth. So, like, the consumption of vegetation, let's say below ground. Let's, let's say, let's say below ground uh, is sort of leading to additional growth above ground, right? So just the planet's comp compensating for the losses that experienced due to herbivory. And there is certainly indications that that happens, but I would say that in, in, in salt marshes in particular, I think what's probably happening more is burrowing leading to increased availability of nutrients, which then leads to the plants to have an increased ability to just like grow and do well. And so I think that those are the dy dynamics that are likely playing out more commonly than the compensatory growth in those spaces. Yeah. And then also the microbial community, which I can't speak to, but is something that is uh, obviously on my list of things to try to figure out moving forward. Anything else? Yeah. Just to ask a little bit more about um, the context and how this is Yeah. I'm really interested in how this has changed Mm -hmm. and given that there's such a dynamic system, do you think that some of that context dependency would have to do with when you sample it and how frequently you have been sampled? And so over the additional sampling point, is mm -hmm. there a problem of self? And the other piece of that I find really interesting is I wonder if that context dependency is also going to come into play when you think about trying to predict the effect of perturbation of the system. Yeah, I mean, all of the above. And so for that work, I I measured um, over a two year time period. So the goal was really to get like a longer term experiment going to get a sense of like how things might be accumulating over time. And within each of those studies uh, periods, I would do like an initial conditions measurement and like a final conditions measurement, but like not a ton in between. And so the goal there was, was really to see what's happening like within years and then what's happening across the years total. So trying to get a sense of that variation. Um, and so I do know that that probably plays a pretty big role. And so if, were I to have had the time to like continue that, like if my PhD were 10 years long, instead of five, uh, God forbid, I um, would have continued that just to really see what those kinds of changes play out as. Um, and to, to your second point was really thinking about perturbation. So that's something that I thought a bit about for this work, especially given that um, as much as I tried to keep sites similar, um, there were really different uh, sort of features in terms of their surrounding environment. So like one site was located 
um, in a residential neighborhood. One site was located in an area that has lots of activity for people who are doing lots of boating. And then another site also was located downstream of like a farm. So like these are different things that are happening across these spaces that I'm sure played a role, but just were not things I was able to take advantage of in terms of evaluating and measuring explicitly to then see how they played out. But I do think that that matters a lot. Um, and coastal systems are known for being relatively resilient, um, but the degree to which they can sort of bounce back from accumulating perturbations, I think is a little less clear, at least in my work. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not a great answer for this question. Um, so I can actually pull it up again for those who are like, what are you all talking about? I don't know if it'll still show. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see that like these two are exactly the same in terms of the variables included in them, and this one is different. That is only because at this site, um, the second sampling point for that variable wasn't possible. <laughs> so I just like couldn't collect that data for that particular site. And so I decided to just exclude it from the model as opposed to just having partial data in, in that particular model. Um, but that wasn't on purpose. So it just was sort of incidental to the way the work ended up getting done. Yeah. No, 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 no process. The world was just like, you can't collect this data. So then I didn't. Um, I also do want to note here that for most path analyses, the way that people do them is not how I did it here. So I think most people will go out, um, they have their data, and then they build multiple potential models of inference and then try to see which model is the strongest model. Um, that wasn't our goal. <laughs> our goal here was really just to say, let's build one model of expected relationships between the variables. Let's throw all of our data into that model and just see what it tells us. Um, so a different scientist maybe would have approached that particular analysis in a different way. But that was just how we decided to approach it here. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we can make zero conclusions. Um, but I think one thing that I, I, I imagine is true regardless is that consumers are doing something, right? I think the sort of generalizable historical assumption that consumers don't matter is wrong. <laughs> uh, and so I think that that means we have to have a better sense for how we put together and develop research projects in those spaces, especially because mega research is really hard. So I think a lot of times people don't do like exclusions like this. I can't put a cage around a mangrove, well, in some cases, depending, um, but it would be hard to try to do that. So I think that trying to figure out how to develop that work is really challenging. Um, but that is my plan, actually. So I, I, I do work now in American Samoa and I do work in Florida now, looking at mangroves in particular to try to fill in some of those gaps. And so right now I'm troubleshooting how to do exclusion or manipulation treatments in those kinds of settings to try to answer some of those super similar questions. But I think my gut is telling me that like something will happen. I just like don't know what that something will be yet. Anything else? Thanks, Dr. Bowen. Cool.